Today we continue on in Revelation as we do once a month and we're getting towards the end. We're all the way to Revelation 18 now and uh, I've entitled it The Bride with No Pride. But before we uh, get into that, I'd like us to just bow our heads in prayer. Lord God, we thank you that you are the king of the universe and you've chosen us as your people to be your bride. What a privilege it is, Lord, to uh, be in you and to have your blood covering us and to know what that means and to live in that. And we just pray, Lord, that your spirit will minister to us today as we think on these things, because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I like the story of the Southern California couple who had raised two very successful kids. One was a high-priced uh, divorce attorney in New York City, the, their oldest kid who was a daughter. And their son was a very uh, successful corporate CEO in Chicago. The only problem was that these kids were basically too successful. They, they were just so busy that they weren't keeping up with what was going on in their parents' lives. And so uh, the son was blown away when he got a call from his dad. And his dad said, I know this is going to shock you, son, but after 45 years of marriage to your mom, I've decided to get a divorce. And the son was just amazed. He, Are you sure, Dad? I can't believe that that's true. It seemed like you have had a good marriage over these years. And the dad said, well, there's just a lot you didn't know, but uh, that's the, the case, son. And he said, but sis, she's going to be completely destroyed by this. Well, son, that's why I want you to call her and, and tell her. And uh, the son said, Dad, don't do this. I know your anniversary's coming up on Labor Day weekend, and you know, I'll, I'll fly in, and let, let's at least talk about this before you tell mom. And uh, the dad said, well, I, I've pretty much made up my mind, but you know, if you want to come, that would be great. And so the son calls his sister, and 10 minutes later she calls the father, and she said, what are you thinking, dad? I don't want you to sign anything or do anything until I've had a chance to fly in there. We'll both fly in for the Labor Day weekend for your anniversary, and uh, let's talk this thing over before you do something rash. And when she hung up, the father put down the phone with a big smile on his face, and he said, Martha, I won our bet. Uh, both kids are coming for our 45th anniversary on the Labor Day weekend, and they're paying their own airfare. <laughs> Wedding anniversaries have their own uh, special significance. Uh, my wife and I get to celebrate our 40th next August, so we're uh, looking forward to that. It's hard to believe how time flies. I, I can't believe we're that old now, but uh, wedding anniversaries don't really compare to the glamour and appeal of weddings themselves. Um, I can still remember our youngest daughter, Stephanie, how she would love to look through these bridal magazines and dream about her wedding. And uh, it was a great joy to experience that with her last summer. Uh, we, we just, you could just see the beam on her face of all those years. And I never remember my son doing that. You know, I, I don't think males in general tend to dream about weddings. That, that's why they call them bridal magazines and not Grummel magazines because uh, you know I've never heard anyone saying here comes the groom at a wedding it just doesn't happen uh, brides are the focus of weddings and there's a big difference between being a bride and being a part of a harem and the king of the universe could have a harem if he wanted to but he chooses to have a bride he chooses to have us, his body, his church, as his bride. In spite of all the jokes you hear about different denominations up in heaven, I, I'm sure you've heard them, you know, St. Peter leads a group and says, shh, be quiet, those are the Mormons in there, or, those are the Adventists, they don't know anybody else is up here, you know, I'm sure you've heard those jokes before, but we laugh at those because we know they're not true. We know that's not what heaven will be like that God's bride is a unified bride. And uh, Babylon is just the opposite. 
And as we look at Revelation uh, 18 today, we see this contrast between Babylon, confusion, chaos, and the bride of Christ, who stands in unity and stark contrast to Babylon. God calls his people in, in this chapter to come out of Babylon, come out of her, my people. And we've talked before about how denominations and the systems of this world will compromise themselves to the beast or, or they will cease to exist when we have the mark of the beast. So we won't have denominations that are faithful and true to God. We'll just have the bride at this time. And God wants to be preparing his people right now for that time that is coming. And this whole chapter really deals with this contrast between the fall of Babylon, the fall of man-made religion, and the true bride of Christ. And I want to talk this morning about the difference between harem theology and spirituality and bridal theology and spirituality. And I want to make four points in this regard. Number one, harem spirituality is produced, uh, it pr is the product of man-made religion and is built on the principles of Babylon. Bridal spirituality, by contrast, is built on the foundation of Christ alone. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Bridal theology is based on Christ alone, but Babylon traces its roots back to the Tower of Babel. And we know what the Tower of Babel was about. It was really about rebellion and pride. Rebellion and disbelieving God that he would never send another flood and pride that we're gonna take care of it ourselves. We're gonna build a tower that will save ourselves. That's what the principle of Babel and Babylon is based on. And of course, it led to confusion. It led to chaos. Uh, the drive to strive and to achieve and pride is what Babylon is all about. And that gets caught into religion very easily. You think of Nebuchadnezzar looking over Babylon and saying, is not this the great Babylon that I have built. And many times Christians can think that way as well. Look at our denomination, we're right, we're true. Uh, look at our church, we're on TV, look at our pastor, he has a best-selling book. Whatever it is, the people have pride connected to their faith or their spirituality or their religion. And this pride often is tied to our behaviors as well that uh, most Christians, in fact, most Americans, when they're asked the question, uh, do you think you'll go to heaven, will say yes, and when they're asked why, they'll say, because I think I'm better than most people. I'm better than the average person. That, that's the typical answer that comes. Martin Marty talks about this in his great book, A Nation of Behaviors, uh, that Americans tend to be a nation of behaviors who mix grace and law together. Most Christians in this country will say, oh yeah, we believe in grace, we're all about grace. That's what they'll say, but there is a mixture of grace and law that the Bible says leads to double-mindedness that describes the Laodicean church, which is hot and cold together, making lukewarm. Hot and cold together means true spirituality mixed with false spirituality, spirituality with the principles of Babylon tied into it. And that makes for a lukewarm situation that nauseates God. God says it makes him sick to see this kind of distortion. And one reason that so many churches and Christians buy into this kind of thinking is that they're afraid of cheap grace. Uh, we don't want to have cheap grace, so they think that we have to mix law into the picture or into the recipe. And, and the irony of this 
is that very mixing of law is what cheapens grace. That's what cheapens grace. That's what waters down grace. That's what destroys the power of grace. That's why Romans 6.14 says, sin will not have dominion over you if you are under grace alone. But if you mix it with law, sin will have dominion over you. You have no choice. Sin will have dominion over you. Uh, dominion means authority over, power over. Sin will control you. It will have a controlling power and authority over you if you mix law with grace. There's no place for that in scripture. I was working out in the LSU gym on Monday and uh, a staff member that I hadn't seen for years happened in there. He doesn't exercise in there regularly, but he just was looking for someone and happened to see me. And so he came up and said, well, I haven't seen you for years. What are you doing? And I told him, you know, I was still pastoring and told him the church and he goes, is that an Adventist church? And I go, no, no, it's not. It's non-denominational, interdenominational. And then he asked the next question that Adventists always ask, well, what day do you worship on? You know, that was, that's always the next question. And I said, well, we worship on Saturday. We meet on Saturday and uh, worship every day, hopefully. Um, but, uh, you know, we don't keep a Sabbath under law as Adventists teach. And he had a lot of questions about that, and I tried to explain the difference between uh, seeing the Sabbath as a blessing that goes back to creation versus a law or requirement that goes back to Sinai. And, um, you know, he, he seemed to really uh, think about that, and I, I don't know how, where that all will go for him. But um, when we had the baptism last week, I, I shared a little bit about what a difference it is to see baptism from a kingdom bridal perspective versus a perspective under law. When I got baptized at 13, it was very much the numbers game, and I was the only one in my class who hadn't been baptized, so I had to get into the fold and had to sign this literal pledge uh, that I would not go to movies and do all this stuff, which I wasn't too happy about. But, uh, you know, it, it was completely tied to behavior. It was completely tied to law. And uh, that was not a freeing thing at all. It was more of a binding thing. Uh, you know, you're, you're pledging yourself to be bound rather than to be freed. And uh, Romans 6 says that baptism is a great freeing thing. You die to your old self, you die to your sinful nature, and you're freed to f fly with Christ, to be covered by his blood, to be in him, to be a new person. And... Um, you know, it's not just in Romans 6 that the Bible tells us that the old man is crucified. Um, really, the whole New Testament, every time it talks about being in Christ, it's talking about this new man, this new woman that God has created. And, and that happens when we accept him, when we're baptized, which is the symbol of that. Um, we're no longer at war with ourselves. We no longer have a sinful nature. The devil will do everything he can to lie to us and make us think we haven't changed, make us think we're the same, make, make us think we're the same old person with the same old struggles. But now we see those things as lies of the enemy rather than being spiritual schizophrenics, rather than being at war with ourselves. That's a very important thing. And, uh, you know, 2 Corinthians 5.17 is talking about this when it says, if any man be in Christ... He is a new creation. Behold, the old things are all passed away, and all things have become new, including our nature. We now have a new nature. We're, we no longer war against flesh and blood, including our own flesh, but principalities and powers that try to lie to us. That's where the war is. It's not with our flesh anymore. It's not with our sinful nature anymore. But pastor, why do we still have to confess our sins? Well, 1 John 1, 9 says, if you confess your sins, plural, he is faithful and just to forgive your sins, plural, and to do what? To cleanse you from all unrighteousness. 
That's a blanket statement. That's not talking about, oh, every time I think I messed up, I have to go confess or I'm going to hell. There's none of that in the kingdom. There's none of that under new creatures. There's none of that in, in bridal spirituality. Um, in bridal spirituality, we don't sin because we're not under law. T to sin, you have to be under law. To be guilty of lawlessness, you have to be under law. The focus of the kingdom is not on sin. It's not on where I'm missing the mark. It's who I am in him. Well, why does the Holy Spirit convict us of sin then? It doesn't. It, the Holy Spirit does not convict righteous people in Christ of sin. That's what uh, John 16, 8 to 11 says. It says the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin. The Holy Spirit convicts the unconverted of sin. What does it convict us of as kingdom people? Convicts us of righteousness. That's what it says. Bridal people are convicted of righteousness. God keeps calling us to the higher reality from glory to glory to glory. He keeps calling us to the destiny of who we are in him. He doesn't sit around punching us, condemning us, having us look at our failures, having us look at our sins. No, he doesn't do that for the bride. He doesn't do that for kingdom people because we're new creatures. We're in a new place of his righteousness. Point number two, harem spirituality is satisfied with pseudo community. Bridal spirituality insists on genuine community. Now most people, even in church settings, don't know each other very well. You know, most relationships tend to be pretty superficial, especially in our culture today. And uh, even in the church, this tends to be true. We're a fairly small church, spiritual family, but still, most of us only know each other in fairly superficial ways, if we're gonna be honest. We don't know each other deeply. And it's very difficult for a human being to know more than just a few people deeply and genuinely. Uh, it's very difficult. And uh, so, you know, to pretend that we do know each other deeply isn't really uh, being realistic, isn't being honest. Reminds me of the story of the man who went running up to the counter of his neighborhood pharmacist that he'd known for years. And he said, can you help me, Charlie? Uh, do you have a cure for the hiccups? And the pharmacist just smiled and slapped the guy across the face. The man said, why did you do that? He said, well, do you have the hiccups now? And the man said, no, but my convulsing wife out in the car still does. You know, and the guy didn't recognize what the problem was. And uh, that's typically the case when we have superficial relationships. We don't really know what's going on in people's lives. We might guess, but we're usually going to guess wrong. And uh, that's why the Bible insists on us having spiritual partners. It insists on us having at least one person that we confess our sins to, that we confess our faults to, that we confess our struggles with. Not in the sense of seeking forgiveness from that person for them, unless we've you know, maybe harm that person, but, but really just being totally radically honest with at least one person that we share everything with and that we have that person praying for us every day, we're praying for them every day, and I really believe it's important to have a, a circle of people that are doing that in our lives. Not only have a spiritual partner, but to have at least a small group of people that we are in that kind of relationship with, not as radically honest as we are with our spiritual partner, but that we know beyond the superficial realm. And that's one reason we try to encourage small groups so that people can get to know each other better than just in superficial ways. Superficial Christianity is the rule. That's what most churches function under. There's very few churches in America that really practice small groups in, in a biblical sense. And we struggle to do it here, honestly. I, I, I don't think the majority of us have spiritual partners, which 
is disappointing to me. I wish every one of us had a spiritual partner that we met with regularly and really function in a biblical manner with. And, uh, you know, many of us might not have even a, a small group or, or people that we're really intimate with in terms of what we're struggling with in life and, and praying over. And, you know, that's not a good thing because what it does, isolation in my work with UCLA and, and treating gambling addicts, uh, I've been doing a lot of research about the connection between isolation and addiction. And there's a very strong connection. There's a very strong correlation between people who are caught up in addictions and who isolate themselves from meaningful human relationships, who keep their relationships at a very superficial level. And what this does is it um, harms the body. Uh, there, there tends to be a great increase of cortisol in uh, people's bodies that live in isolation, that don't have genuine community. And uh, I've just been looking at a couple books that do talk about a lot of studies here. 2020 Thinking is quite an interesting book along these lines. Brain Longevity talks about a lot of studies and research in this area. but. Um, one of the studies they talk about is with monkeys, you know, where they do the Pavlovian thing, they uh, expose a monkey to a light, and then they administer a shock to that monkey. And uh, they shock them at different levels. Um, but th the interesting thing in the study is that when they have one monkey present with, or then they measure the cortisol increase when they shock the monkey. Um, and the interesting thing is when they have one other monkey with them, when they administer this shock, the amount of cortisol that shoots into the system is less than half, just from having one other monkey there. That's pretty amazing when you stop and think about it. If there are five monkeys there, there is no increase in cortisol at all. And that's monkeys, you know? You're not talking about human relationships here, you're talking about monkeys. Uh, just think what that means from a human perspective. If we have meaningful relationships and community, what a role that's going to play in reducing stress in our lives, protecting us from cortisol, which is one of the, the real killers in the human body. So basically, um, you know, when you look at what it means to be a bride, and, and you compare that to what we find in harem theology, we see that there's a huge difference uh, between true community and superficial community. And I had a lot of senior pastors over my years at the university, and um, I found that it was very difficult generally to trust the senior pastors I had. The, 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 when you get to senior pastor at that level, in systems, you're usually a pretty political person. And they were very political, generally speaking, and I had real concerns about confiding in them until I had Rudy Torres as a senior pastor, and that was such a stark contrast. Uh, this guy was just so amazing. Uh, we had such a powerful, close relationship. Uh, I could tell him anything and not worry about him using it politically against me. You know, it was just a, an amazing, positive relationship of support and comfort and, and friendship that uh, I prize to this day. Uh, I call Rudy once in a while and we talk, but, um, you know, we laughed a lot. We enjoyed a, a shared sense of humor. And that's a big thing in life, too, people having a, a similar sense of humor. Um, we were talking about that in the Sabbath school class today, that... Many times husbands and wives don't have a shared sense of humor. They, you know, they, they don't see the same things as being funny. And, uh, you know, what the man might think is funny, the, the woman might think is insensitive. And um, I, I knew a guy, had a friend who worked in a hospital, and he was the manager of the softball team for the hospital. And uh, each year he would collect mitts and bats and things from the different people on the team and then when the season was over he would return you know this equipment to 
the different players on the team. And he was telling me how he was returning a bat to a, a surgeon who played on the team one day in the hospital. And as he walked through the waiting room with this bat, a husband who was sitting there with his wife who was just about ready to have surgery said, look, honey, here comes your anesthesiologist. And, uh, you know, he was just trying, <laughs> trying to relieve the tension of the moment. But uh, the wife didn't find that funny at all, you know. And, and uh, the man said she broke down into tears. And she just was distraught that her husband was so insensitive. So having a, a sense of humor that resonates with each other is helpful, or at least learning, you know, how to uh, relate to that. But um, anyway, it, that's all part of community and living in healthy relationships with each other. Um, number three, a harem spirituality is, it produces a ministry of the few. Harem theology or spirituality produces ministry of the few. But bridal spirituality produces a ministry of the many. And, you know, there are many churches that are very good at producing pew potatoes. They're huge mega churches, and, and many times people are attracted to those churches because they want to disappear. They want to be anonymous. They don't want to get involved. They want to just show up for an hour a week and, and be pew potatoes. But um, that's not the way of the kingdom. That's not the way of the bride. And... Uh, you know, denominations and their hierarchies can certainly contribute to this, especially with paid clergy. It's very easy for people to get the idea, hey, you're the pastor, you're paid for doing this, you do it. And that's one good thing about this church is we don't get normal salaries, so I think I get a stipend that's about a quarter of what I used to get as a pastor. So if someone says, hey, you're the pastor, you paid, I say, they don't pay me enough to do this. Uh, you guys uh, all are part of our body here, and we're all in this together. And that's what God wants. Uh, he wants a priesthood of all believers. He doesn't want a paid clergy that do everything in some kind of hierarchical system. The more people get involved, obviously, the more powerful the bride is. And, um, you know, when I was in Orange County, there was a church there that tried an experiment that got a lot of press. I don't know if you heard about it. It was on the news and stuff. It wasn't a big church, but uh, the pastor felt convicted to give every single member who wanted uh, to participate a hundred dollar bill and to invest it in the marketplace of life, to invest it for the kingdom and to see what would come back. Uh, and, and it produced neat results. That was a $10,000 investment and it ended up bringing back more than 10000 to the church. And I thought that was kind of a neat thing because there were all kinds of creative uh, outreaches and stuff that people came up with. So we, we tried that with our Keys board. We had 15 uh, members in our Keys board at that time and it was quite active and we actually had some money uh, with that Keys board. Uh, and uh, so we gave $100 to each board member and I gave them a little talk about, you know, the not bearing your talent and at least getting interest if you weren't going to uh, do anything with it. But uh, you know, the, the neat thing was out of this $1,500, we had $5,700 come back. And there were all kinds of neat creative investment projects that people did. So when people get involved and they begin to use their own creativity, their own gifts, it's amazing to see what God will do. And some of you may be thinking, well, why don't we try that here at Kingdom Life? And since Gary's the treasurer, you know, if he wants to front the money for that, I, I will support that. 100%, uh, but <laughs> you can uh, check with him on that. But, uh, you know, I, I was good friends with Tony Campolo for many years, and it was always amazing to me to see how he motivated his kids to get involved with stuff. He had this orphanage in Haiti and all, all these projects in inner city Philadelphia. And, and when Christmas would come along, you know, he'd say, to his kid, uh, well, do you want a 10 speed that you've been talking about, or do you want to go with me to Haiti and uh, participate in what I'm doing there? And these kids learn to choose the altruistic, uh, service-oriented options, and now they've grown up and they both have very powerful ministries of their own, because that's what was modeled for them. 
And, and modeling really is the most effective way for us to reach our kids. I, I know when I was little, my mom each Christmas would make a nice basket and with all this divinity and fudge and special stuff in it and take it around to all the neighbors. And I saw her do that every year. And it took me many years to really follow that example. But about 15 years ago, I started doing that in our neighborhood. And now it's something I wouldn't want to not do. I look forward to those little connections with the neighbors once a year and giving them a basket or a book. I, you know, I think I started out with Rick Warren's, one of his books, Purpose Driven Life, or one of them. But anyway, um, that, that's a very rewarding thing to get involved and, and to find how our gifts can express themselves in a way that will make a difference in the world. And, you know, our gifts are, are very different. Um, Larry has been doing a lot to help Tom and Carolyn, and he's very gifted at fixing things. Uh, they're having to remodel a bunch of apartments, and, and Tom and Carolyn were just telling me this week how Larry and his crew have just been lifesavers to them. And, um, you know, you wouldn't want me to do that. You know, if I came in and worked on your plumbing, you would be cursing me. Uh, you, the electricity would never work again. Uh, I, I do not have a gift for fixing up homes and doing this kind of thing. Uh, everyone has their gifts. If I fix your car, you're going to be in big trouble. Uh, but Roger knows what he's doing. And uh, so, you know, basically, um, we have to figure how our gifts can fit in to being a priesthood of all believers. And, uh, you know, there was a time when I was much more active for the poor. I, I was very happy when we were running a soup kitchen every day. Uh, even though I'm not a cook, I'm not good at cleaning stuff up, but I had people that jumped in and were really good at that and uh, made it happen. And those were seven really happy years for me to see the hungry getting fed and people getting clothes every single day, even though it was a lot of work. I missed that. But I, I'm glad we have Rose and her team here doing a lot of that kind of work. But, um, you know, this re really leads to the last point, which is harem spirituality focuses on worship at the expense of ministry and service, whereas bridal spirituality recognizes that service is inseparable from worship. Service is inseparable from worship. Religiosity is something that makes God vomit. God hates religiosity. We see this in the Old Testament in Isaiah 1, 11 to 14, where God says, I hate your religious services. I hate your worship. I hate your sacrifices. I hate all this stuff you're doing that's isolated from true service, from really living love, living out love for other people. I hate it, God says. And in the New Testament, we have Revelation 3. We have the Laodicean church. He says, I, you make me want to vomit because you have this mixture of law and grace so that law triumphs over love. Love is not the true force. Love is not leading the way. Law is overriding it. It's contaminating it. It's keeping you from being what I've called you to be. When, when there's law triumphing over love, uh, we make God sick. And uh, you might think if, if you're spirit-filled as a Christian that you won't have to worry about this. But it's amazing to see what Jesus says over in Matthew 7, 22 and 3 to these charismatic believers, uh, you know, who've healed the sick and they've done all this quote, spiritual stuff through the Spirit. And Jesus says, I don't know you. You don't know me, you workers of lawlessness. That's the key phrase there. They're under law. They're doing all this stuff under law. And in the years that I've become much more familiar with many charismatic churches, much to my surprise, I found that even many charismatic churches function under law. They, they're, they're very much tied to law. Uh, they have this mixture of Babylon, 
uh, that contaminates a true bridal spirituality. When we look at the choosing the vertical at the expense of the horizontal, we, we realize that scripture says a lot against that. You know, James 1.27 says, this is righteous religion to care for the widows and the orphans, uh, to care for people who are hurting. That's righteous religion, that's number one. Matthew 25.40, Jesus says, as you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. That, that's the core of healthy spirituality. And uh, of course, 1 John 4, 7, 8, Beloved, let us love one another. He that loveth not knows not God. It's impossible to know God in a true vertical healthy relationship and not love our fellow human beings. So if we don't lead with love, the vertical is compromised. I like the text over in Proverbs 14, 31, and I think it's the Good News Version that puts it this way. He who helps the hurting worships his maker. He who helps the hurting worships his maker. So what this text is really saying that it's impossible to have a healthy vertical spirituality if we don't have a healthy horizontal spirituality. But, but the Bible does seem to imply that you can have a healthy horizontal spirituality and that will result in worshiping God. God will be pleased. You know, there are people who've never seen a Bible, they've never heard the Christian message, but they lead with love. They've been sensitive to the Spirit, Romans 2 says. They've heard the voice of the Spirit in whatever language they understand it, and they lead with love. And God says, I, I accept that as worship. I accept that as a healthy, vertical spirituality. Jesus lacked religiosity. In fact, he, he completely lacked religiosity. That's why he got condemned by uh, those who majored in religiosity. And uh, I really like uh, this new book that's out, uh, Pharisectomy. You know, it's basically uh, an attack on religiosity. There's another good book called Religious uh, transmitted diseases on this same subject, but um, there's so much religiosity in churches, and Jesus had nothing of that in him. He just wasn't about religiosity at all. His focus was on using his gifts to serve in whatever way the Father called him to serve. And if we're going to follow him, then we're going to have a focus on sacrificial, extravagant love. I think of the story of the uh, father who was teasing his little five-year-old daughter. And he said, oh, I saw you the way you looked at that boy. You like him. And she said, Daddy, I don't like him. He only thinks about one thing. And the father was, what? What? What's that? And she goes, Power Rangers, Daddy, what do you think? Uh, you know, she, she was saying the kid had a one-track mind and the father was a little worried about what that might be. But uh, in the kingdom, God calls us to have a one-track mind that's focused on his son. Revelation 14, 4, the bride follows the lamb wherever he goes, wherever he leads them. We have a one-track mind to follow Jesus and to use whatever gifts he's given us to build his kingdom, to his glory, not to our glory. That's the key thing. The more we're God-focused, the more we're focused in his grace, the more we're focused in his goodness, then we're in a place where he can minister to us and minister through us in life-transforming ways. And uh, as we close today, I just want to invite you to his table uh, if you haven't already partaken of it. Uh, I really believe that his table um, is the symbol of what it means to be a bridal people, uh, to be completely focused in him, to be completely covered by his blood. And I believe that the more we understand this and enter into this, 
the more this table releases miracles. I really encourage you each week that we have the table here to partake with the expectation of a miracle. Think of something miraculous that you desire in your life and ask the Lord to do it through his body and his shed blood. This is the drink of the bride with no pride.